necessary. And um, a reminder that later you can put your views on the outcome of this election either by ringing on the phone or by email. Sue Lawley will be joined by a studio audience who will be challenging the politicians in person. You can contact us by email at the ITN election website where you'll also find the latest election news and results. The telephone number is 0990 168 718 and the address is www.itnelection.co.uk. I may have had too many WWs. Anyway, so Tony Blair, the new Prime Minister, is in charge and in Downing Street. But who will he choose for his key cabinet posts? Who will he choose? We'll find out because we're going to be back after the news in your region. Yes, indeed. Stay with us here on Carlton for the election news across our region from the newsroom of London Today. And that's next. <coughs> when best friends fall for the same woman. It's me and the moron. Max? Of course it's Max. He's ugly, isn't he? <laughs> Everyone needs some form of release. I fish. It usually means war. And with these two, it's no exception as they battle for their prized possession. Walter Matthau. She's mine. And Jack Lemon. But she came to me. In a fight for one woman. Rob, that fish. Grumpy old men, bank holiday Monday, 8.30 on call. How was I? I felt very nervous. I think I got the AA insurance put over. And I'm sure I mentioned me care. But I don't think I got over how chuffed I was with the deal I got, you know. AA car insurance costs less than I thought. Call direct on 0800 444 The Woolwich has always been known for mortgages and savings. But today's Woolwich offers you PEPs, unit trusts, and a variety of bonds as well. And now with the Woolwich, you can not only insure your house and its contents, but your car, your holiday, and even your life. Are you with the Dynamax? No! We're with the Woolwich! <laughs> Get much more with the Woolwich. Jersey, where spring comes earlier and we grow the most delicious new potatoes with a flavour all their own. Jersey Royals, the flavour of the month. Using spades and forks can be backbreaking. Now tear through your gardening with the Garden Claw. It's all very easy. The Garden Claw has a patented design that virtually eliminates bending and lifting. Turn the handles and the steel tines corkscrew into all soils, even clay. It's ideal for working around plants and shrubs. It's perfect for mixing in compost and fertilizer. Also available the Mini Claw for plant box and container gardens. The Garden Claw in the blue and yellow box. Available at Wyreville, Adrian Hall, Country Gardens and Robert Dyer's. Getting paint onto walls has never been easy. So Black & Decker and Dulux came up with Paintmate. Dulux put their once paint into bags and Black & Decker put their know-how into Paintmate. The paint is pumped straight to the roller. So getting Dulux on walls has never been easier. Down, boy. Paintmate from Black & Decker. Are you in the know about Cheerios? I know, I like them. What about nutrition? <laughs> nutrition. Corn, oats, rice, and wheat. Four grain nutrition and not too sweet. What, in one cereal? Yeah, but only in Cheerios. Did you know that? Oh, I know that. Four grain nutrition and one great taste. Cheerios. Just look at the way Arthur moves. He's a real cool cat. That lean, lithe loveliness must be down to the vitamin D and protein he gets from the meaty chunks inside every can of Arthur's cat food. I've always fancied myself as a bit of a cool cat. <laughs> well, you know your trouble, mate? You've got no sense of style. Mm. Arthur's. Nothing else is Arthur's good. You want good meal ideas, but can't think what to do. I soon make it easy, the problem solved for you. Get the Iceland's family favorites, food you know they're all in. Bernard Matthews Golden Drummers, half price. Iceland cones have 50p off. And McVitie's American Dream Florida Orange Pie, that's half price too. Favorites. I 
Then make it easy. Amma. A murder, a boy witness, and retribution. What happened 12 months ago was a random act of violence. You sure about that, are you? He was the son of a cabinet minister of debt protection. I don't see why Alan can't have the same. But even protection can't stop this gang's desire to kill the spy. You should have had someone on, Jamie. That's right, I think they're going to go. They still think they're invincible. Everyone's a target. I don't want Alan involved in this anymore. No more guesswork. I want intelligence. Bodyguards, Thursday at 9 on Carlton. Now on Carlton, London Today, election special. Hello and welcome to London Today on what is quite simply one of the most astonishing days in the capital in living memory. The Conservatives have lost their grip on London and they haven't just been defeated, they've been crushed by Tony Blair's New Labour. A day of triumph too for the Liberal Democrats as big name Tories were booted out right across the region. Among the victims, Michael Portillo and David Mellor. In fact, of the 133 seats in the region, more than a third changed hands and all of them Tory losses. Before the election, this was London's political map. This morning, it's a completely different picture. The Tories did have 41 seats, now only 11 remain. In the whole of the South East, the Tories had 98 seats. Now, they have 50. These are the 48 seats in the region lost by the Conservatives last night. More than a third of the Conservative MPs were voted out. 43 of their constituencies were taken by Labour. The other five seats fell to the Liberal Democrats in the southwest of the capital. Now, it was the result that, without doubt, delivered the biggest shock to an election night that was full of drama. Michael Portillo, a man many had tipped to become the next Conservative leader, was kicked into the political wilderness by his North London constituents. The former MP for Enfield Southgate called the voters' verdict truly terrible for the Tories. For Labour, the mood was one of astonishment after stealing the seat even they thought was out of reach. Where do I go now? Today, Michael Portillo joins London's unemployed. An enforced change of direction last night for the man many saw as the next Conservative leader. I declare that Stephen Twigg is duly elected Member of Parliament for the constituency. He sensationally saw a majority of 15,500 turn into defeat. Well, I think there were two uh, particular reasons. One, one was we had been in for 18 years, and the other was that we were uh, disunited. And on the latter point, I trust the party will learn its lesson. Leading London Tories were stunned. I think if you'd said to me that we'd lose Michael Portillo, I wouldn't have believed you. I, I really didn't think we would be uh, in that kind of trouble. But where once blue was the only colour in comfortable Winchmore Hill, they're not surprised. Many told me he took their vote for granted, even those who appear remarkably similar to Mr. Portillo politically. It's uh, my own personal opinion, is it's a bit of a shame, but uh, I didn't actually see much evidence of the Tories uh, campaigning around here. I did vote for him. But on the other hand, the Labour Party, I think, put up a much better campaign than he did. We never saw Portillo around at all, except on election evening and that was it. The winner had emphasised he was a local and it worked. I'm relishing the opportunity of going back home to the area that I was born and brought up in and representing the people of that area in Parliament. It's going to be great and I can't wait to get started. Voters say Mr Portillo ignored local issues at his peril, even slipping up on a hamburger. Plans to turn his party headquarters into a McDonald's turned supporters against him. In Enfield, this is Phil Bales for London Today. Tory post-mortems are going on right across the region. The loudest voice is that of David Mellor, soundly beaten by Labour in the Putney seat he'd represented for 18 years. No smiles from the former Minister of Fun today. He immediately launched a blistering attack on his biggest foe, referendum party leader Sir James Goldsmith. And this lunchtime, in an exclusive interview with London Today, he also pointed the finger of blame at those within his own party. Coleman Tony Labour Party, 20,084. 
The morning after the worst night in his political life, David Meller is blaming his own party for his dramatic downfall. I think the tensions of the t period we were in office allowed us the luxury of being disunited, which I've always said on Crosstalk, you know, if we don't hang together, we'll all hang separately. I've been saying that for months and months and months. He was, however, jubilant that Sir James Goldsmith, standing against him as leader of the referendum party, lost his deposit. I do believe I can put one thing on my escutcheon, and that is that I have wiped James Goldsmith off the political map of this country. He can't buy the British political process, and quite frankly, he got a derisory vote. He didn't even deserve the derisory vote he got, and I think Mexico beckoned. But before going anywhere, Sir James had a few volleys to fire at David Meller. The man is obviously a political charlatan, always has been. He was not telling the truth to his constituents. We tried to put it right, but it's quite difficult to do quickly. And I'm delighted for Putney and for the British political system that we see the back of him. However, Mellor's defeat was not as extreme as that of some of his colleagues. You know, when I think that our swing was around 11% and the swings against a number of Conservatives in London were 15, 16, Michael Portillo's case 17%, 18% next door in Wimbledon, you know, I think to myself, we fought a creditable campaign. But now, with Tony Coleman taking Putney for Labour with a majority of nearly 3,000, fights between Mellor and Goldsmith lose their significance. This is Liz Wickham for London Today. Well, Sir Reg Boyson was another of the Tories to lose his seat after 23 years as MP for Brent North. First of all, commiserations to Rhodes. Were you expecting to lose your seat? No, I wasn't until I got into the counting room and I could see it was going wrong. Up to that day, uh, it seemed on the doorstep quite uh, reputable in what we were doing. I must say that the, the Labour Party fought a great campaign in London. I have to say that. They actually took the issues up and they backed up their candidates inside the different uh, constituencies very well indeed. All right, so what went wrong with the Tories? Who do you blame? Well, I think there's about four things. One thing, it, we, the battles we've had amongst ourselves, the, the electorate do not like that. Secondly, we weren't, it couldn't get this straight, it straight on the question of the referendum on, on, on Europe. I mean, I believe that if we'd have come out straight out and said no single currency in the next parliament, we'd have saved about five or six seats. People understood that. They didn't understand saying on this side you can do that, on this side you can do, do it on the other. I think it was about three or four things that actually had the case, but we'll have to get the London together again. John Major has already said that he will step down. Who do you see stepping in? That I don't know. I mean, uh, once you, you, uh, somebody resigns as, as, as party leader, it's an open book. And I should imagine that I'm not fortunate, uh, unfortunately now, I'm not in the House of Commons to have my own say regarding that, but I shall watch with great uh, interest who is selected, because the, whoever is selected is going to obviously go on to the next general election. It may be five years ago, but we're to start now. All right. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Sir Thank Rose you. Boyson. Thank you. Well, it's lunchtime. Londoners are just beginning to get used to the idea of life under a new government. As the capital basks in yet more spring sunshine today, all the talk on the streets is, of course, that Labour landslide and what it will mean to all of us. For some, despair in defeat. For others, a day of huge celebration. Arthur Williams wheels away the empties at the Festival Hall after Labour's biggest victory celebration of this century. A new dawn for the Champagne Socialists. According to them, things can only get better. And over in Smithfield Market, the news sinks in over breakfast. About time we kick these parasols out. Out with the old, in with the new. London's refuse collectors not slow in coming forward with their comments. Yeah, I'm glad uh, David Mellor's out. No more sucking anybody's toes anymore. I had a long enough them old conservatives. This lot can't be no worse. Over at Festival Hall, Tony Blair's coronation was just beginning as he glad-handed young voters who, for the first time in their lives, were waking up to a Labour victory. This is just amazing. This is just the, what I've been waiting for. Young people, old people, middle class, everybody's here celebrating the fact that we have a new Prime Minister. Six cabinet ministers out shrieked the billboards. So was this Michael Heseltine's predicted nightmare or a brave new day for Londoners. Very upsetting. I suppose they have high interest rates before long. Pound to go down. Holidays to be more expensive. I'll tell you in a year's time. All those people can't be wrong, can they? I'm not all that keen on him. 
Tony Blair. The brutal business of being a loser on the day after the election, as John Major is unceremoniously dumped at Madame Tussauds, and into the spotlight steps Tony Blair, the youngest Prime Minister this century. And so London awakes to a new day. The Palace of Westminster is changed, and with it, the fortunes of the capital. But Tony Blair has promised a new deal for London, an elected city government and Lord Mayor. Time will tell if that promise is fulfilled. In central London, this is Christopher Peacock for London Today. Well, 48 seats have changed hands right across the capital, and here to tell us about the picture in more detail is our political correspondent, Paul Larsman. Paul. Thanks, Mary. Well, the labour assault on the capital and the counties surrounding it spared neither humble backbencher nor minister of the Crown. Linton Martin, Labour Party, 24,000. The end for John Bowis, London's transport minister until just a few hours ago, now looking for a new job. Battersea has been my life for the last 10 years. The people of Battersea have been in my care. I care for them, Martin, and now they're in your care. You care for them well, because in five years' time, we want them back. Well, as the night went on, Mr. Bowis was joined on the casualty list by some of the Conservatives' most familiar figures here in the capital. Dame Angela Rumbold, Deputy Chairman of the party, was another high-profile victim, losing in Mitcham and Morden. In the west of London, MP Nurge Diva lost Brentford and Isleworth. In Harlow, Jerry Hayes is also out and turning on his former colleagues. The, pu the, the public do not vote for divided parties. The likes of Bill Pash, the likes of Theresa Gilman ruined the Tory party. And of course there was Basildon, where Essex man who embraced Mrs Thatcher so enthusiastically back in the 80s opened his arms to new Labour. Other Tories to go included Jakes Arnold, Gravesham living up to its reputation as a constituency which always returns an MP of the governing party. Gone, Rhodes Boyson in Brent North, Sir John Gorst in Hendon North, Robin Squire in Hornchurch, Hugh Dykes in Harrow East. Charles Goodson Wicks in leafy Wimbledon fell to an 18% swing, one of the biggest in the country. Piers Merchant hung on to Beckenham despite those newspaper allegations about an affair with a 17-year-old girl, but his majority was slashed from 23,000 to 3,000. The Liberal Democrats surpassed their wildest dreams, cutting a swathe through the affluent suburbs in south-west London and winning the most seats in Parliament a third party has achieved since the 1920s. Former party chairman Jeremy Handley was ousted in Richmond by the Yellow Horde. Twickenham's Toby Jessel was another victim of Paddy's party. Sutton and Cheam now has a Liberal Democrat MP. So does Kingston, where there was a massive swing of 13.6%. So does Carl Scholten and Wallington. For the man who used to be our region's only Liberal Democrat member, it was a nail-biting finish to the battle against Labour. But Simon Hughes emerged triumphant. But us at last to be winning, not just in the London seats, but out of London seats, as we haven't done for a very long time, is very, very exciting. And it means that London and London's people will have a balanced political view. Some Tories, more Labour, but many more Liberal Democrats. Finally, two seats in West London are now linked by more than just a political allegiance. Alan Keane was already Labour MP for Feltham and Heston. Now his wife Anne has been elected to serve in neighbouring Brentford and Isleworth. So, Paul, what does this Labour landslide actually mean for London? Well, Mary, by far the most exciting thing is their plans for a new Greater London Authority, a sort of son of the GLC, and, of course, a new directly elected mayor. Between them, they'll be responsible for things like economic regeneration, the environment, the policing of the capital, and transport. They'll be actually appointing the board of London Underground to be responsible for getting all that money into the tube that we so badly need. But I must warn Londoners, don't hold your breath. Uh, one of the architects of the, the innovations told us just earlier on today that it's going to take quite some time. Actually, I think we will have a referendum, hopefully, uh, in the first bill before Parliament, and then it will probably be, by the time we get elections, it'll be 1999 or the year 2000. But what a wonderful way to celebrate the new millennium, and Londoners want it. So, Paul, any names coming forward as a possible mayor for London? 
Uh, nothing formal yet. I don't think they've advertised the job, but there are certainly some people who have uh, said that they'd be interested. Looking at the political uh, names, first of all, uh, we've got Tony Banks. He said he'd absolutely love the job. Uh, he'd give his right arm for it. Ken Livingstone, he once told me that he'd love the job as long as it had some real power attached to it. Uh, on the right hand of politics, then Steve Norris. He's going into industry now. He might start uh, hankering after some power again before too long. And then there is, of course, David Meller, uh, ousted from Putney. I'm sure he'd like to get back on the political scene. And for the Liberal Democrats, Simon Hughes, why not? In the non-political arena, well, we could look at somebody like Richard Branson. He actually uh, topped a poll uh, held uh, by the Evening Standard of readers last year. They'd like him to be mayor. Uh, there's uh, Simon Jenkins, the former editor of The Times. Frances Lawrence, the widow of Philip Lawrence, the stabbed headmaster. She might be interested in continuing her moral crusade. And finally, well, the Spice Girls. Uh, they'd probably win hands down. Mary. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Now, the capital's not only entering a new political era, but also a new social one. Tony and Cherie Blair's move into 10 Downing Street is already being compared with the so-called Camelot age in America, a golden time when John Kennedy and his glamorous first lady Jackie held court at the White House. Like them, the young and charismatic Blairs are expected to breathe new life into London's society set. Tony and Cherie Blair prepare to move into Downing Street, the dawn of a new era, Many are comparing it to when John F. Kennedy and Jackie moved into the White House, a young, idealistic couple ready to blow away the cobwebs. Cherie will be Britain's premier hostess, presiding over a charmed inner circle. But just who will be part of the Blair's Camelot? Blair is a huge rock fan, and Oasis can expect an invite to number 10 after declaring their support. The boss of their record label, Alan McGee, is certainly in. He donated £50,000 to the Labour Party and is delighted to be a Blair buddy. He's almost my generation, do you know what I mean? I mean, he's six years older than me. And he's obviously, when you've got a younger Prime Minister in there, you know, that's obviously going to be, you can be in touch with people a lot more. George Michael is also pally with the new Prime Minister. He's pledged to act as an ambassador for education. These kind of trendy chums will certainly keep the Blair children happy. They'll be the first young children to live at number 10 since 1908. That will create a complete difference. You know, there'll be bicycles, skateboards, there'll be a, a, a whole new set of furniture, I guess, in Downing Street. Although Labour were careful not to cultivate a lovey image during the election campaign, Tony Blair is definitely the darling of the film industry. They know that film, television, the creative arts are the cutting edge of the UK's economic growth into the 21st century. David Putnam is a close friend. He saw in the new year with the Blairs. I think the first in, the immediate impression you get is this is a, someone you could be a, a friend of. He's incredibly honest. But the Blairs are legal eagles at heart. Their oldest friends are lawyers, including Helena Kennedy and Lord Irvine, who's tipped to be the next Lord Chancellor. Stylish press aide Alastair Campbell will also be part of the Blair court. I think that he enjoys a relationship with Tony Blair, which is at least as close and arguably rather closer than Bernard Ingham had with Margaret Thatcher. And finally, media folk, Greg Dyke, Melvin Bragg and Clive Anderson, have all shared cosy suppers. Rupert Murdoch is highly likely to be included, but perhaps not at the same time. It'll certainly be a potent mix of pop, power and politics. This is Yasmin Pasha for London Today. Well, one high-profile woman who definitely has the air of the new Prime Minister is Barbara Follett, who was last night elected MP for Stevenage in Hertfordshire. She and her husband, the millionaire author Ken Follett, are good friends of the Blairs, part of a group some have accused of forming an elite clique around the Labour leader, much like the Kennedys' Camelot, of course. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to Barbara about what she thought of that comparison and what it means to her. Well, it's a new hope, a new beginning. And I think, you know, the very youth of the Blairs He's one of the youngest Prime Ministers we've ever had in Britain. And just the weather all lends to the feeling that this is a new beginning. And when Tony said it's a new dawn, everybody cheered, because it is. They've been compared to the Kennedys, haven't they? I, I suppose almost inevitably. What do you think about that? I think it's their energy and their vitality which makes them Kennedy-esque. Um, with my voice, it's very difficult to get through energy and vitality at this morning. We've been up partying too late, celebrating last night, were you? No, chest infection from canvassing in the rain. <laughs> There's a great talk as well of girl power taking over Parliament. Twice, in excess of twice the number of women MPs elected this time as last. How much difference do you think that is going to make to Parliament? I think it's going to make it a much more problem-solving place rather than a posturing place. 
At the moment, we have a lot of Boise kind of interaction. And somebody said to me on the way here, oh, all those women will make the men behave better. Do you think that's really the case? Less combative, if that's what you're saying? Yes. I think we need to look at what we can do for the people of Britain, not we can, what we can talk about doing. And women tend to be more orientated to doing rather than being. Practical problems, though, if you're going to be a woman MP, aren't enough women's lose in Parliament? Is that really true? It's true, and they're all upstairs, all far away. But it's going to be good fun. You're looking forward to it, I imagine. I am, and I'm looking forward to getting my voice back. All right, we'll get better soon. Thank you Thank very you. much, Barbara. Well, now, three people who are definitely not members of Mr Blair's inner circle are Ken Livingstone, Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn, all definitely to the left of New Labour. But first of all, congratulations. Beyond your wildest dreams, surely. I think Labour supporters in London in particular are walking on air today. Yeah. We've won places Harrow, Brent, North, Hendon. We never dreamt of winning. Ken? It is just a stunning result. I mean, uh, Tories are down to 11 seats in London. I mean, this is, a, I mean, even in the, the best days in the past, I mean, they never fell below about 30. I mean, it's a wonderful result. And it, it liberates people. Everyone wakes up this morning and thinks, this isn't about did Labour get rid of them. We got rid of them. People have ca cast off the chains. They're free. Everyone's floating on air. Yeah. It was this fantastic atmosphere yesterday. People mm. just walking to the polls, cheerfully yeah. smiling, hugging each other, everybody together. It was their day. It was their victory. It was a fantastic feeling. I've got to ask you, Ken. New mayor, elected mayor of London, what do you say? Well, it depends. It, I'm not too worried about whether they have a mayor or a council. The real issue is, is it going to have power? The Treasury has never wanted a London authority to have the powers to raise the funds it needs to do things. If it's a talking shop, I wouldn't be interested. If it's got the real power to tackle London's funds, I'd love it. But I have to warn you, no, it's no, okay, no more Mr Nice Guy next time. All right, now I've got to ask you as well, that you are not part of this elite sort of inner circle, are you? You're very much to the left of the party. Are you going to be outspoken now, Diane? Because some people say that you've been gagged, all of you. We were never gagged. It would take more than Peter Mandelson to gag me. <laughs> I'm very happy <laughs> to be one of Mr Blair's humble foot soldiers <coughs> in the onward march of socialism. But it's not going to be a radical government, is it? How can you... How do you know? How because do you it's know? never been presented as such. I think that Tony Blair could turn out to be the FDR Roosevelt of British politics by knitting together a, a coalition and actually proving to be more radical in practice than people thought. Do you agree with that, Jeremy? We've got rid of this madness of monetarism of the past 18 years and uh, Tony Blair's government has got to address the problems of the inner city and I believe it will. We represent inner urban communities, 20% plus unemployment, hopelessness, lack of housing, appalling housing conditions. We are going to get some changes made and that's what we are for. That's what Labour MPs are for in inner urban areas and I think we're going to have a government that's going to work with local authorities to solve the problems of London rather than this sort of paranoid hatred of local government that's been pursued by the Tories. You and you see, the moment he takes office, he's got this 20 billion deficit. We're borrowing 20 billion this year to try and make ends meet. So we're really going to be in a serious debate about a most massive tax increase, and we want to make sure that that burden falls on the corporate sector, which pays mm. so little, and not on ordinary taxpayers mm. and VAT payers. So I, right from the beginning, all this nonsense you've heard from Major about, oh, a wonderful inheritance, that's so much old toffee. Whoever won this election was going to have to make major tax increases. That's why if Ken Clark had got back, they would have put the own tea on food. They were, we've got to make sure we don't go down that road. We actually save the corporate sector. Thames Water has not paid a penny in tax on all its profits since it was privatised. That's where we want our money coming from. It's going to be a tricky, tricky road ahead, though, isn't it? We've sort of, in a way, had the honeymoon period. The easy bit's over. He's now got to form a government. <coughs> Yes, but he's got the biggest Labour majority since records began. In a way, he's got a carte blanche. And it'll be fascinating to see in the coming days who he puts in the government <coughs> and what's in the Queen's speech. Mm. But he's got to run the Parliamentary Labour Party in an inclusive way and recognise that there's a strength of experience, determination and intelligence there that can all contribute to totally transforming this country into a society that cares for each and every one of us rather than this horror of all those young kids sleeping on the streets across the river there. All right, we'll leave it there for the moment. Stay with me, Jeremy, Diane and Ken. Thanks very much indeed. Well, Islington, it's said, is where New Labour was born. It's the home of Mr Blair and his family and many of the people who've helped reform the party. Our reporter Marcus Powell is there with Labour supporters who are celebrating in Tony Blair's local pub. Hello, Marcus. What's the atmosphere like down there? Hi, Mary. Well, it's subdued celebration. They are a very happy bunch. I mean, you can probably see them all sitting out here in the sunshine and they are enjoying themselves. They're not exactly sort of uh, waving and clapping their hands, but there's a great feeling of contentment. I mean, this is a sort of gentrified part of Islington, the Albion pub, 
quite a posh area, but uh, one has to say it's a real mixture of people here. We've got doctors, we've got lawyers, we've got some squatters, and we've got some single mums. But amongst all of that group, we have almost universal support for the Labour Party. Is the new PM a regular drinker there, then? Well, I can't say uh, that he is, to be honest. Uh, it's a little bit exclusive, this pub. It actually excludes kids under 14, so uh, it wouldn't be very politically correct for him to turn up regularly because he'd have to leave them at home. Now, tell me, did the players actually leave their home in Islington and move to number 10 today, or what? Exactly what's going to happen on that? Well, they will be moving as soon as they can. I think from a security point of view, um, their house across the road is a nightmare. They're going to have police guards there from now on. But in order to accommodate them at number 10, they're going to need to make several alterations. So it'll probably be a few days before they can actually decide what they want, get that work done and move out. But uh, I think we'll see a lot of increased security here in Barnsbury before they actually do move. But move, I'm sure they will, as soon as they can. Mary. All right. Thanks very much indeed, Marcus. Very briefly, how are you going to spend your weekend celebrating, I dare say? Oh, it's May Day Marcus tomorrow. Is that that? I've been knocking on doors every Sunday since Christmas. I'm going to have 24 hours sleep. Jeremy. Thank the people for their support. Arsenal, Newcastle tomorrow, and May Day rally <laughs> on Monday afternoon. Brilliant. Thanks very much, all of you. Thanks a lot. Right, that's it from me this lunchtime. The next news update is in London weekend tonight at 6.25. But now, from me and all of us, bye-bye. Have a very good afternoon. Ian Richardson. Faye Dunaway. Sir Derek Jacobi. Dame Diana Rigg. Charles Dance. Sheila Hancock. Nigel Habers, Joanna Lumley, Michael Jaston, Gemma Redgrave, Clive Owen, Saskia Wickham, Sean Bean, and me, from Carlton, on Carlton. We return to the studios of ITM here on Carlton next this afternoon for further coverage of Election 97. That's great. But who are the chefs? Not going anywhere for a while? You're a googly moogly. Grab a Snickers. You spell it. Yeah. Okay, you're going to love this guy. Runs like clockwork. Time? 0620. He's finishing breakfast, and right now he's heading for the shower. 0621. He's in the shower. 20 Celsius, 53 seconds. 0622. He brushes his teeth. 20 strokes. Is it the crispy golden flakiness? The lightly sweetened honeyness, or the flaky hint of nuttiness that makes Kellogg's Crunchy Nut Corn Flakes so irresistible. 0625, he's at the door. You can set your watch by him. Kellogg's Crunchy Nut Corn Flakes. The trouble is, they taste too good. Now, the leader of the old El Paso party. People, the time has come to unite under one party. The old El Paso party. Time to get back to basics. Authentic flour tortillas, new cooking sauce, sizzling chicken. These are the values that bring people together, central to our vision of a united people. The pajita is in your hands. Vote Old El Paso. Join the party. <laughs> Jersey, where spring comes earlier and we grow the most delicious new potatoes with a flavor all their own. Jersey Royals, the flavor of the month. Boom shakala, good boy. David! What? I've ironed your shirt for you. Do you have to go out tonight? The Lynx Effect. <sighs> they say you are what you eat, which in Arthur's case is perfectly true. He adores Arthur's cat food with its special combination of vitamins and omega-6 and 3 oils. Therefore, he is Arthur, lean, lovely and delicious. <laughs> I, on the other hand, only eat this. Which makes me tall, thin, and Italian. Eventually. Arthur's. Nothing else is Arthur's good. And we have a late-breaking update. 
There's been a new occurrence of the worldwide shrinking phenomenon. Yesterday it was the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower, and we've just received word from London that Big Ben has become Little Ben. Despite rumors, Ericsson denies any involvement, but do admit to the launch of their smallest ever mobile phone that still gives you up to 60 hours standby time. The Ericsson GF788, so small it will change your perspective. Oh, my goodness. Don't worry, Henry. All just Blue Cross means we can easily afford to buy twice as many bargains. <laughs> Blue Cross ends Bank Holiday Monday in the Alders mid-season sale. Well, now, here on Carlton, we return to the studios of ITN. Welcome back to election 97 on ITV. Tony Blair as Prime Minister is in Downing Street and so is his family, although in fact this evening we learn they're going to go back to their home in Islington for two or three weeks to stay there as a family while presumably things are done to Downing Street, although of course he will now work from Downing Street. And another former Cabinet Minister has gone down. Roger Freeman is out in Kettering. There were three recounts before it was determined that Labour had gained Kettering with a majority of 189. Um, Ken Clark is going to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Ian Paisley is back in Antrim North, and we will be going to Northern Ireland this afternoon, not least to Belfast West, to see how Jerry Adams of the Sinn Féin fares there, where he hopes to take it. But now, at a moment before all that, let's have a summary. <music> Labour's won with a predicted majority now very settled at 179. 642 out of the 659 seats in Labour's got 419 of them, the Conservatives 162, the Liberal Democrats 45. That's going to be their number, I think. And the rest, including the SNP, on 16. Labour have gained Putney, they've gained Brent North, they've gained Brecon and Radnorshire. The SNP, the Liberal Democrats gained Brecon and Radnorshire, the SNP have gained Perth. And Roger Freeman, the seventh cabinet minister to go out. Six was a record, seven therefore is all by de almost by definition a record. Michael Portillo, Ian Lang, those three faces no longer in Westminster in Parliament for the time being at any rate. The same goes for William Walgrave, Michael Forsyth, and Malcolm Rifkind. And for Angela Rumbold, Sebastian Coe, and Edwina Curry, three faces no longer there. Jerry Hayes is out, Norman Lamont, who hoped to take Harrogate and Knaresborough for the Tories and be back in Westminster to fight his Eurosceptical stance is not in the House of Commons and Giles Brandreth is out as well. Here are some council election results. Two Conservative gains, some small mercy, although it would have been surprising um, if they hadn't gained given how appalling their situation has been in the local election since the last general election in 92. They've gained Bedfordshire from no over control, they've gained West Sussex from no over control. Labour has won Thurrock, that is in the council elections. And here are the seats won. Labour has gained 74, the Conservatives have gained 40, the Liberal Democrats have gained 25. Those are the council seats. And now to catch up on some of the news this afternoon, Dermot Murnaghan. Dermot. Thanks, Jonathan. Good afternoon. Labour is celebrating a landslide victory, the scale of which hasn't been seen for 160 years. Britain's new Prime Minister, Tony Blair, declared a new dawn has broken and it is wonderful. The British people have put their trust in us. President Clinton has telephoned his congratulations. And the European Commission President, Jack Santa, said the Labour victory is a chance for Britain to play its rightful leading role in the European Union. John Major has announced he's resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. He said when the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage. And a short time ago, Kenneth Clark declared he intended to stand in the Conservative leadership election, which will now follow. In a devastating night, the Tories lost seven cabinet ministers, including Michael Portillo, Malcolm Rifkind and Ian Lang. And Neil Hamilton, the Conservative fighting Tatton, lost the safest Conservative seat in the north of England to Martin Bell by a massive 11,000 votes. Well, a short time ago, Tony Blair and his wife Cherie walked the short distance along Downing Street to number 10. Hundreds of people gathered to give them an ecstatic welcome. Britain's new Prime Minister then stood outside his family's new home and told them Enough of talking, it is time now to do. Our political correspondent, Hugh Pym, reports. A new era, a new dawn. A victorious Labour Prime Minister at the gates of Downing Street for the first time in more than 20 years. 
and some quite unprecedented scenes as Tony and Cherie Blair walked up to number 10. They were welcomed by hundreds of ecstatic Labour Party workers and their children. And then Mr Blair outlined his vision for his government. It shall be a government rooted in strong values, the values of justice and progress and community, the values that have guided me all my political life, but a government ready with the courage to embrace the new ideas necessary to make those values live again for today's world. A government of practical measures in pursuit of noble causes. And then on the threshold of number 10, the Blairs paused for that memorable image signifying the handover of power. The youngest prime minister this century leading his family into their new home. And there haven't been young children living here since the early 50s. Earlier, in stark contrast, John Major had left number 10 for the last time. He offered his warm congratulations to Mr Blair's team, but then a surprise, he wanted to quit as Morning. Conservative leader. When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage, and that is what I propose to do. I shall therefore advise my parliamentary colleagues that I believe that it would be appropriate for them to consider the selection of a new leader of the Conservative Party to lead the party through opposition during the years that lie immediately ahead. This will necessarily take a little while to organise, Parliament must meet, and the members of Parliament must make their own consideration of this matter. Naturally, I shall remain at the service of the party during what I hope will be a reasonably brief interregnum. Brief was the key word there, Mr Major clearly wanting to hand over the reins in his party within weeks rather than months. The farewell said he was off in the brutally efficient British political tradition there'd be no return to Downing Street. The removal vans already waiting at a discreet distance to do their job. And at the palace there was Mr Major's final audience with the Queen after seven years as Prime Minister. It was only in the early morning light as Mr Blair arrived at Labour's celebrations in London that the scale of his achievement, his party's achievement, was beginning to sink in. Just winning would have been enough for them after 18 years in the cold and four successive defeats for Neil Kinnock as much as anyone. But to secure Labour's biggest ever election triumph and to sweep the Tories from power so comprehensively was beyond anything they'd dreamed of. And Paddy Ashdown, in his own way, would have been no less astonished at the extent of his party's progress, doubling the number of Liberal Democrats elected in 1992 and creating a third force unparalleled in post-war politics. I want to spend most of my time reflecting on the truly historic performance of the Liberal Democrats in this election. We have proved uh, that timidity is not wrong in this campaign. In an age of spin doctors and negative campaigning and attack advertising, we have nevertheless demonstrated that it is possible to put hard choices to the British people. And Labour's landslide will transform the face of the House of Commons. When the new MPs are sworn in next week, there'll be many more women, many younger members, some in their 20s who wouldn't have expected to get elected, but who've been swept in on Labour's tide. They'll all play their part in pushing through measures like devolution for Scotland and Wales, reform of the House of Lords, in what will probably be the most radical constitutional reform package seen this century. QPIM, ITN, Westminster. Well, many of the country's leading Conservatives have lost their seats. In Scotland and Wales, there's not a single Conservative MP left. Senior Tories are calling for a period of calm reflection, although they now, of course, face a leadership battle. By contrast, the Liberal Democrats are overjoyed. They've won 45 seats, as we heard, double the number they had before. Robert Moore reports. Twig, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,000. It was the moment when a Conservative Party defeat became a disaster. So bleak that cabinet ministers like Michael Portillo, tipped as a possible party leader, found themselves no longer even in Parliament. In all, six cabinet ministers lost their seats. Ladies and gentlemen, a truly uh, terrible night for the Conservatives. Uh, I would have wished to have been part of rebuilding it inside the House of Commons. I can't now do that, but I would like to do whatever I can 
from the wings. In Scotland, the Foreign Secretary Malcolm Rifkin was out. So were his cabinet colleagues Ian Lang and Michael Forsyth. It has left the Conservatives in the humiliating position of being reduced to an English party, for they no longer have any representation in Scotland or Wales. The mood at Conservative Party headquarters in central London was of disbelief. They knew they were staring at the lowest Conservative share of the vote since 1832. But John Major, who arrived here just before dawn, displayed remarkable grace in defeat. But now he has decided to step down quickly. Harsh new decisions are already crowding in on the Conservative Party. But there is emerging perhaps a view among senior Conservatives that beyond the selection of a new leader, there must be time for reflection and analysis. Will you be throwing your hat into the, the ring? question of the leadership is a secondary consideration. What the Conservative Party must do is to look at the lessons to be drawn from this general election. Uh, we need to rebuild uh, the centre-right coalition, uh, which I still believe represents the majority viewpoint of the British people. But there are other well-known Conservatives coming to terms with political defeat this morning who warn that the great schism in the party over Europe will continue when the party is in opposition. Whatever the British electorate think of Europe, or of Monsieur Santerre, or of anything else that goes on in Brussels, the fact is they know we're in it and we have to make the most of it. And until my party gets its head round that fact, we are likely to face continued defeat. In one of the few ugly scenes in the long night of Tory defeats, in Putney, David Mellor was jeered by the referendum party leader, Sir James Goldsmith. And we have shown tonight that the referendum party is dead in the water. And Sir James, you can get off back to Mexico knowing your attempt to buy the British political system has failed. Thank you very much. From almost all Conservatives, though, there was dignity in defeat. Nothing symbolising the right better than this Yorkshire count, where Sir Marcus Fox, one of the longest serving and most prominent Tories, lost his seat to a Labour Party activist, aged just 24. While the Conservatives suffered and Labour triumphed, the other story of the night was the resounding tactical success of the Liberal Democrats. It was their best result for over 50 years. Much of their success centred on the frenetic campaigning of their leader Paddy Ashdown and the shrewd targeting of seats. We are the largest force of Liberal Democrats and Liberals that this country has had since the days of Lloyd George. And, and we will use that force, we will use the vote that people have given us. The Liberal Democrats are vowing to pursue their own agenda, but in reality the huge Labour majority may still limit their influence. But this morning they could not conceal their delight at the historic breakthrough. Robert Moore, ITN. And that's it for me. Now back to the Election 97 studio and Jonathan. Dermot, thank you. And now some of the results that have been coming in, we can have a look at on my results computer here. And here we have Kettering. This is what we were talking about before. This is a Labour gain. This is the seventh cabinet minister down after three recounts. Labour is in and Mr Freeman is out and the swing from Conservative to Labour 10.6% but look at that majority 189 so Labour have gained Kettering seven former cabinet ministers down however a potential leadership candidate Mr Haig, William Haig is in the Conservatives have held Richmond in Yorkshire with a majority of just over 10,000 a very safe seat because note there's still that very large swing from Conservative to Labour there of almost 14% Legan Valley now, this is in Northern Ireland, the Ulster units have held on there. This is an absolutely secure, safe seat with a majority of 16,925. They've also held Londonderry East, you can see they're going across your screen. Strangford they've held on. This is John Taylor, one of the key figures in the Ulster Unionist Party, his majority 5,852. So Strangford is held by the Ulster units. You get very few changes in Northern Ireland. Down north, a majority here of just 1,400 and... 49 in down north for the independent UK Unionist Party, UK Unionist Party. That was one in a by-election and he's still there. Mr McCartney is in again. Now, one more significant fact about last night's results, which we've been discussing through night and today. There will be more women MPs in Parliament, this Parliament, than ever before. 
As we stand at the moment, 88 women will take their place in the House of Commons, an increase of almost a third. Lawrence McGuinty reports on this. Follett, Daphne Barbara, the Labour Party candidate, 28,000. If Labour women have done well in this election, no one can take more credit than Barbara Follett. She co-founded the Labour Women's Network and started Emily's List to promote women candidates. She was a third time lucky winner in Stevenage, typifying the success of Labour in getting in the votes to turn women candidates into MPs. In Enfield North, Joan Ryan told me being on Emily's list had caused some resentment. Ryan, Joan Marie, Labour Party, 24,148. But that evaporated when she turned in a 16% swing to win the seat. And after turning over William Waldegrave in Bristol West, Valerie Davy had this to say about the new parliament. We are, from all accounts, to see a very special new government arriving in Westminster very soon. One of the things I'm very proud of is that there will be more women there. Yeah! Gisela Stewart, the Labour Party, 23,000. Yeah! Declaration after declaration, the women, especially on Labour's side, turned out to be winners. As the celebrations begin, one fact is remarkable. Blair's victory is also a victory for women. Five years ago, 60 women were elected to Parliament. In this election, twice as many, 119, have already been elected. And 102 of them are Labour MPs. Lawrence McGuinty for election 97. While that package was running, we've just heard that Gerry Adams has won his seat back in West Belfast. He held it from 1983 until 1992, and Joe Hendron held it from 1992 until now. That result will cause consternation, not only amongst the constitutional parties in Northern Ireland, but for the new government as well. The last thing they wanted was Gerry Adams to be returned. We'll be going over there to pick up on that. Um, later on. But meanwhile, on the question of women in Parliament, we had, I had the figure slightly wrong, what we've got at the moment is 119 women in the new Parliament, twice the previous record of 60, which was the 1992 Parliament, and of those, something like 98, 98 are Labour members of Parliament. And I have two, if they'll excuse the phrase, two battling Barbaras nodding away with, <laughs> with the great approval at this, Lady Castle, Barbara Castle, and Barbara Follett, both of whom have fought for women in Parliament hard. You must be very pleased. Barbara Castle, first of all. Well, I think one of the most gratifying things about this election result is the big upsurgence of women. And I do congratulate Barbara Follett for being one of them. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's very interesting, looking back at my starting days in 1945, it was always Labour which gave the women their chance. Yes. In the 1945 election, there were 22 women elected and 20 of them were Labour. And one of the others, the Liberal, Megan Lloyd George, joined the Labour Party shortly afterwards. So women of the world unite behind the Labour and Party. And yet Barbara Follett, I would suggest, might think that, that old Labour wasn't on the whole. Quite a lot of men in old Labour weren't too hot on having new women in. I mean, it was a tremendous struggle, oh, yes, um, your Emily's list, wasn't it, Barbara? Well, it was a tremendous struggle for Barbara, too. And I have yes. a great deal of admiration for women like Barbara Castle who fought under old labor. Now look, I don't want this to be, although I'm sure it is, a mutual admiration it society is, between you. Let me ask it. you, let, of course it is. Now let me, you're obviously both delighted at this result, but you represent historically two different characteristics, old labor and new labor. And I don't refer to your maturity, Barbara Castle. You may, that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I bet you are, you should be. But my real question is, there's a sort of coalition in labor now between the old values of labor which are supposed to be reincarnated in the new um, uh, common sense of new labor can that coalition actually hold together don't you stand i mean you battling on pensions and saying it's outrageous barbara follett part of new labor saying no we have to be very careful on public spending and taxes mustn't um taxes mustn't. who wants to go first before you both get into co <laughs> cahoots together I, I think you can probably see that old and new Labour work very well together here. In fact, I'm middle-aged Labour, if we're being exact. Middle-aged Labour with no voice. 
will it make your poor voice has gone, but while you've still got a whisper left, I'll come back to, to Barbara Castle in a moment, will it make a real difference? People say, yes, of course it will make a difference. Do you believe it will make a difference? You, you're a new MP, so you don't even know what it's like inside there. No, I don't, and I'm mildly dreading it. But I think it will make a difference. I think it will make it into a, a body that solves problems instead of talking about solving problems, and that's what we need to do. Barbara. Well, I, I tell you what strikes me about this election result. It proves, you know, that the 1992 uh, general election, uh, far from being a watershed between old and new Labour, in fact, was an unnecessary hiccup in the progress of public opinion in this country to reject Thatcherism and everything it stood for. I've, I said at the time, uh, we oughtn't to have lost that election. It wasn't that our policies were too way out and the rest of it. It was simply two things. One, that people wanted to change. If Margaret Thatcher had been fighting in the last election, we'd have wiped the floor with her. But in course, John Major had come in, Mr. Clean, you know, looking so moderate. Uh, people said, oh, we've had a change. But also, we haven't got what we've had this time, the great um, machine, electoral machine. But, 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 but last time in 1992, the Labour Party was committed to increasing taxes, increasing, in, committed to using a tax system to reduce the gap between the rich and poor through redistribution. This time round, that's ruled out entirely. No, it, I don't, I don't let, think let, that's let, let, fair to, to, let to Tony you, Blair or let, Gordon Brown to let, suggest let, that everything is going to go on. The present distribution of income in this country has produced massive poverty among so many of our children. And the women in this parliament won't tolerate that, I can assure you. I want to tell you one of the differences between this election and the last one. In the last general election, women over 50 turned against Labour and they turned against Labour because of their economic policies. What New Labour is saying in 1997 is that we will redistribute within the current spending package. We will use what we've got more efficiently. Barbara Follett, Barbara Castle, two Barbaras, thank you very much for joining us. And now we're going to look at health. This is one of the big commitments of Labour within very controlled public spending. But before we do that, we can get the Belfast West result, that's the Jerry Adams result, up on my computer here. Here is the Belfast West result. As I said, a Sinn Féin gain, a majority of 7,909 for Jerry Adams, 25,662 his vote, Joe Hendren on 17,753. So Sinn Féin leader is in, in Northern Ireland's West Belfast seat. And now to, 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 to look at the health that we want to look at, to see this is the, the situation where the Labour Party is going to have to face the demands of health on the one hand and the knowledge that the constraints on spending over the next two or three years are, 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 are very considerable. So let's do that with Alistair. Jonathan, thanks. So <clears throat> Labour have won, but what are they going to do with it? All of the polling evidence suggests that health was indeed a key issue in the election. So let's see precisely what Labour has promised here. On the NHS, the main manifesto pledge is to abolish the internal market and so save money by cutting back on bureaucracy. But on the GP fund holder scheme, it says that what's needed is reform rather than abolition. Labour says it would use savings to reduce waiting lists by treating an extra 100,000 patients with a specific pledge to end any wait for cancer surgery. Overall, it matches the Conservative pledge to increase spending on the NHS in real terms every year. And one further detailed pledge worth noting. Labour says it will ban tobacco advertising. Richard Branson said last night he wanted that. So, on the face of it, some fairly significant changes in the way the NHS is going to operate. Jonathan. Thanks, Alistair. Now for an instant reaction to Labour's health plans. Let's go live to Robert Hall in Winchester. Robert. Yeah.